<laughs> Good afternoon, folks. Welcome. Warning and caveat. This session is about soft and fuzzy stuff. People skills. I'm going to ask you to hold a mirror up to yourself and examine your own preconceptions and the things that are your unwritten rules. So, interpreting the unwritten rules and perhaps turning them into guidelines. This is me. I'm a Kiwi. I'm from New Zealand. I work for that organization. I do a lot for InfoQ. I'm on the board of the Agile Alliance. I have five children, and the thing that I'm most, that is the most fun at the moment in my life is I have seven grandchildren. Now, those of you who are parents, when you take your children to your, your parents and they spoil them rotten, feed them full of sugar and so forth, just want to let you know it is deliberate. <laughs> it is revenge. Deal with it. <laughs> Grandchildren are an absolute joy. Okay. Um, here are two plates. Turn to the people that you're sitting with. Which one of these plates is right? What do you feel when you see these two plates? Turn and have a conversation. Which one feels correct or incorrect? And why? That one, why? What? Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Which one is correct? Why? Okay. What else? Any any other feelings when you look at this plate? Okay, so the, the uh, where the fork is. Why? There's no food wasted. Yeah, whereas the, there we got waste food. Sorry? Uh, that, that cutting knife was actually a steak knife. Because it was a, both of these had pieces of steak. All right, now they're all wrong because that was non-veg. <laughs> okay. Not like that. They should have been ah cross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now. I grew up in New Zealand. My parents came through the uh, Second World War or the aftermath of the Second World War when we had food rationing. My unwritten rule that was beaten into me was clean your plate. If there is food left on your plate, you are a wastrel. 
I, was, I remember being told there are children in Africa who would love that cauliflower. I made the foolish mistake of actually saying, please send it to them. Not a wise thing to do as a six-year-old. <laughs> if I'm in China, in, in Hong Kong in particular, if I clean my, pla my plate, I'm saying to my host, that wasn't enough, I'm hungry. On the other hand, in New Zealand, that waste. Or, if I'm in the Middle East, by leaving something on my plate, I'm saying your generosity is appreciated. This is an example of an unwritten rule. We all have them. And they've come from many, many different aspects of our lives. How do you feel? I told you this was all about soft, fuzzy stuff. In your tables, have a quick conversation. What is your emotive reaction to these three events? How do you feel? So again, another two or three minutes chat. Let's get some feedback. How do you feel? Somebody new joins the team. Hmm? Exciting. Hmm? Anxiety. Why anxiety? Ah. What are they going to take that's mine? Yeah. Oh, or what could I learn from this new person? There's an all-hands meeting in the canteen. Everyone's called the other. Oh. <laughs> Pizza again. <laughs> Waste of time. Hmm? When's the next cricket match? That's all right, New Zealand won, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm al I almost didn't believe that that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was once in an organization where we had the all hands meeting and what was happening was they were being told we're closing this office goodbye <laughs> now thereafter my response to the all hands meeting was abject terror <laughs> we're heading out to do a team building activity is lunch included yeah <laughs> Is booze included? Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm? It's on a weekday or a weekend? Uh huh. Yeah. We've got a mandatory company barbecue on Sunday. Gee, wow. <laughs> well, we all, again, have these visceral reactions, and they're a result very much of our filters. Another question that, that often comes up, and this is a one that we're seeing a lot harder today, a lot, a lot of different responses to. Um, there's a really good TED talk by this lady, Tai Selassie, that talks about where are you local? And if I look at myself, I was born in New Zealand, lived in the UK, lived in South Africa, 
returned to New Zealand, subsequently lived in the UK again and in Hong Kong. And this here are my trip it stats. So far this year, excluding this trip, I have traveled 73,000 kilometers. 48 days away from home, nine cities, four countries. It's March. So, yeah, my most common residential address is seat 34C. <laughs> but we often ask people, where are you from? How would I answer that? I'm going home tonight to New Zealand, so maybe that's where I'm from. But perhaps a better question, and this is what uh, Salai Salasi asked, is where are you local? Where are the places in the world where you go that the shopkeepers recognize you? And I can think of five cities where I go there regularly enough that I'm a local. I've got at least some friends who I know I can get hold of on a Friday afternoon and plan something for the evening uh, so I'm not sitting bored in a hotel. That I know where the, the local convenience store is and the, the, the person behind the counter recognizes me. We might not know each other's name, but we, we see each other regularly enough that we feel local. And this is a phenomenon in the, new, in the modern world, is this being multi-local. We do. You too, Jeff. You're almost local here now. You've been here three weeks? Yeah? Uh, where's Ellen? Is she here? No, she's not here. She is local. Man, she has taken us around here Phenomenally, Ellen Grove, she gets local very quickly. Again, these are things that influence our thinking. When you, when you do become multilocal, we, we move easier between different societies and we adapt. So I understand if I'm in Hong Kong and having a meal with somebody, I will leave some food on my plate, even though in the back of my head, I hear my mother saying, there's a child in Africa who wants that. <laughs> so we look at our world through multiple filters, and these are the things that give us our viewpoints. The angle, and they're, they're like a kaleidoscope. Each one overlays and changes the, the picture that we look at. One of them is culture. There are multiple aspects of culture, and those, who, those of you who were in uh, Evan's session, he did actually mention the Hofstede's model of the five culture dimensions. This is a comparative view of two cultures that I'm very familiar with. I live in New Zealand now, but I spend a, a reasonable amount of time in Saudi Arabia. The five elements, the first one is power distance. How important is status in that society? And the, the scoring goes from zero to 100. Saudi Arabia scores a 95. I come from a country that has a 22. We are the third lowest power distance society in the world. Status does not matter. If the prime minister of the country to walk into, uh, were to walk into our office to come and uh, talk to us, and we've had ministers of parliament and so forth come and do this, he'd be lucky if I'd call him John. Because really, we pay his wages. He's just a civil servant, an expensive civil servant. We pay him far too much for it. In Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, I would never get near the king. I wouldn't be let within a thousand paces because there would be too many people in the status. We also look at individualism versus collectivism. 
we're a very individualistic society in New Zealand. The rights of the individual. Whereas Saudi Arabia is strongly collectivist. The needs of the many. Family honor. Those sort of things matter significantly. We don't, uh, and as Westerners in general, we have no perception of this concept of, of face and loss of face that is strong in many of the, the Asian cultures because it's just not part of our makeup. Um, the a badly named factor is what Hofstetter calls masculinity. He says the, this is the difference between living to work and working to live in the society, which is, which is more important, the quality of life or success in the workplace. Now, both of us are slightly on the um, success in the workplace side of things. Uh, above 50 is uh, considered to be live to, wor uh, wor uh, live to work rather than work to live. Then uncertainty avoidance, and this one for me has a strong correlation with the uptake of agile methods in particular in a society. How comfortable are we with ambiguity? So 49, we're, we're, we're on the ambiguity is okay side, but we still want some requirement. 80, yeah, yeah, don't give me anything less than a 200 page specification document. <laughs> and if you wanna change it, there will be a change control process. Now, I'm working with teams in Saudi Arabia, and one of the hardest things that they're finding is accepting the agile philosophy towards ambiguity and requirement. And this makes it make sense to me. And the other one is uh, not every society was measured there for long or short-term orientation. Um, how far in advance do we plan? The extreme case of this one is Japan. Japanese companies generally have a hundred year plan. They, it's not detailed, but they are working towards a hundred year plan. What Toyota is achieving today, they were thinking about in the 1960s. It's an adaptive plan, it does change. But they, that's their time horizon. We're the, the lowest society in this measure is the USA. Uh, I think they score a 12, and, and, and you can see it in the US financial system. The quarterly results are the things that matter the most. Uh, for, for me, I think this one is a danger in my own economy in that we are not very good at planning for things like retirement. New Zealand hasn't, didn't have a, uh, a compulsory superannuation scheme until about five years ago, no, about 10 years ago now. Uh, whereas Australia scores a bit higher in that, and, and one of the things that I can say, see the difference is they've, they've had compulsory superannuation for the last 50 years. And it, ge it provides their economy with a strong foundation as well. So understanding who you are, what, what are those cultural aspects? It's, it's things like, you know, there's the visible stuff, but a lot of it is, is the, the hidden meanings. Time is a great one. Evan asked us what, what direction does time flow. I figured out that in, uh, the, in the Middle East, inshallah is a time period. It means when God wills. So if you ask somebody when something will happen, inshallah. At some stage in the future, when its time is right. Until then, don't get worried about it. Uh, I worked on a team where we had a person from France and a person from Germany. Now, to a German person, uh, this is a broad generalization, but to a German person, time is an absolute precise factor. If we make an appointment for 9 a.m., they will be at there at 8.59 and 57 seconds, ready to start talking business. To the French person, as long as the clock had not st struck 10 o'clock, they were on time. 
these two struggled to communicate. And it was only when we sat down and tried to figure out what was causing the tension in the team. And we, we came to our team's agreement on what time meant. And that's the other thing that we see as we begin to understand each other, as we come to our common acceptance of what are these the right, for us, factors. Another of the filters that we look through is who am I? My personality. And there's myriads of different tools for, for exploring these things, the, the introvert, extrovert, the Myers-Briggs. Um, I can never the, remember the name of the other one there, but it looks at the four general perspectives that we take. And none of these tools are particularly precise, but what they are, is they, they are useful tools for thinking about what and how you want to be communicated with. Um, Naresh spoke about all of the introverts. Well, I've got a, a beautiful introvert story, and my wife will forgive me for this. We'd been married 24, 25 years. And we finally did one of these tests together. We were at the uh, Expanding Your Effectiveness Conference with Jerry Weinberg, Johanna Rothman. And a lot of these ideas come from them, by the way. Um, and jo Johanna took us through a, a simple Myers-Briggs profile. And something came out. My profile shows that I'm the super E extrovert. You know, I'm way out on the extreme end. Well, you would never have guessed. My wife, on the other hand, is pretty much at the opposite extreme introvert. So much, see, she is so afraid of public speaking that she gave up a degree in fine arts because she had to do a presentation at the end to a group of 100 people. She could not do it, and she failed her degree. I hadn't really thought about these differences much. Um, but it explained a, a particular event that happened in our marriage. Nancy was having a, a significant birthday. And my daughter, who youngest daughter, who is very much like me, the E in extrovert, could be us, um, she said to us, don't make a big fuss. Just have a few people around and we'll have a quiet dinner. Yeah, that was not going to happen. So we sent out invitations, come to what is not my wife's 50th birthday party. And we got a cake made that said, this is not mom's 50th birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> and the two of us were absolutely mortified that she had a horrible evening. Once we did this Myers-Briggs thing together and looked at it, it was, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I'm learning. We're coming up 36 years and we're still together, so I've I must have learned something. Um, just to, to give the contrast, uh, a few years later I turned 50 and we had a quiet party with 65 people at home and bagpipers. <laughs> that was a quiet party for me. Another one of our filters is our values. So these come from very much our experiences and the beliefs that the people who are influ influential, influential in our lives have given us. So, don't waste food is one of my values, and you can see it. <laughs> what is right and wrong? And it's really important to be able to look at those and values are, are things that we share, but also when values clash, we don't understand why we, we don't necessarily get on. Okay. And then there's, how am I feeling right now? Am I tired? Am I scared? Has it been a good day? Is my stomach a little bit un comfortable because I had too much curry. What's going on? My po 
position, my feelings? Am I distracted? Am I happy? Am I excited? And very important is, if I am feeling in any way threatened, what barriers am I putting up? What, uh, what is driving my defensive reaction? And every one of these comes together at every moment in time. And it drives our interaction, it drives our behaviors. Now, there's a poem here, and uh, you know, all, everything you should never do on a slide have a lot of words. But I'm going to read it out. It is worth reading. If I do not want what, what you want, please try not to tell me that my want is wrong. Or if I believe other than you, at least pause before you correct my view. Or if my emotion is less than yours or more, given the same circumstances, try not to ask me to feel more strongly or weakly. Or yet if I act or fail to act, in the manner of your design or action, let me be. I do not, for the moment at least, ask that you understand me. That will come only when you're willing to give up changing me into a copy of you. And this comes from the book, Please Understand Me. When I read that, it was an epiphany. Because we do want everyone around us to be like us. So coming back to those rules, those, those filters have become rules. They've become habitual. Now a rule is something that is inviolate in our minds. And they constrain us. And when we are forced to break a rule, it causes us stress. So for me, one of the rules that I grew up with was clean your plate. And being able to move past that and not feel uncomfortable if I did, you know, I've had enough. That was a big pile of food. Thank you. Or I need to leave something there to be polite. That was hard. And it was one of the first things that I personally tackled. There are a lot of other rules that I've managed to work through. And here is a, a simple technique. <laughs> simple to describe. Hard to do. For transforming these rules into guides. So a guide is something that is contextual and situational. I can look at this and say, Okay, under these circumstances, this behavior is appropriate or not, rather than I must always do this. So the first thing you want to do is state the rule precisely. And here's one that I hope many, I, oh, no, I'm not going to say I hope, I suspect many of us have got in the back of our head. We want to do that perfect job. I must do the perfect job. And if I don't, I feel under stress. I feel I've let myself down in some way. So the first step is to change the must to a can. I can always do a perfect job. Yeah. Change the always to sometimes. I can sometimes do a perfect job. And now... I have the opportunity to say, when is it appropriate? What is the right context? When does this guide matter? So I can do a perfect job when I feel the job is important, I have sufficient time, and the nature of the work permits it. If those three things are not met, I am allowed to do a less than perfect job. And suddenly I am free from that stress and tension that I feel when maybe we're under time pressure, we've got to get this out the door, 
and I have to compromise my quality needs. Or am I the only one that has that? Does this make sense, right? We have time. Your turn. Please turn to maybe pair up for this activity. Find something that you are struggling with. Is there a rule and can you turn it into a guide? We've got 10 minutes. that go? Anyone prepared to share something that they worked through? <laughs> mm -hmm. And under what circumstances now is it safe not to? <laughs> Yeah, the the guilt of, you know, I, I want to do something else, but I feel I need to go to the office. Anyone else? Uh, good. <laughs> that is an inviolate rule, and there's a piece of leg legislation about it as well. <laughs> yeah, some rules are rules. <laughs> Yeah, I can't think of a circumstance under which <laughs> drinking and driving would be wise. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, I must respond to phone calls immediately. Yeah. You feel, did you work through that one? And and did that how did that feel coming to that conclusion? That's the key. It it gives you the okay not to be guilty. Yeah. Yeah. So the must not could become a can as well. Yeah. 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 But yeah. 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 And it it's okay. Thank you for that uh, and for that honest exploration. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're coming up to time, so any questions or thoughts on this one? We have filters. We look through the world look at the world through our many filters, and we're all different. We're the result of all of our experiences have brought us to where we are today. Different isn't wrong. Different is just different. Those filters become rules which do govern our attitudes and behaviors, and rules restrict our choices and cause us stress. Many rules, not drinking and driving, should be reworded to become guides. And guides give us that freedom to make good contextual decisions. So thank you very much, folks.
And we've got two minutes left for questions or conversation. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you should be examining your viewpoint constantly. And it's it's one of the characteristics of emotional intelligence is we we're able to take that that review constantly. Yes, yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, so there are, there are some invariants which often are embodied in law. Yes. Yep, community perspectives. Well, at <sighs> now we're getting deep into ethics. I lived in South Africa for many years. I consciously broke some of the laws there because my personal ethics said I didn't want to abide by the apartheid rules, for instance. So, but that was a conscious choice, and I knew that there was a consequence of that as well. So, that, yeah, this is deep into ethics. <laughs> Where you know, the we, we laughed about the, the drinking and driving, but that is a, that is. Uh, an invariant law. There may, in fact, be a circumstance if, we're, if there is somebody dying and I need to take them to hospital and so forth, under which I could imagine needing to, to drive even though I've had something to drink. But then I've got to understand that there is, I'm making a conscious decision which is in violation of not just a, a personal rule, but perhaps one of those bigger laws. And where does the, how do you deal with things in a situation where, where the laws and your personal values differ? And, and I'm not in a position to advise. <laughs> well, our time is up. Thank you very much, folks.